Hey, hello, how's everyone doing? Glad to see you. Mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Appreciate all that you do, moms. Gotta keep raising the kids right. Appreciate it. Uh, Neil Han, how you doing? Faith's RV trip, how you doing as well? Glad you could be here. Uh, today, a little bit different. We're going to be taking a, a look at the book from uh, Klaus Schwab, The Global Bug Reset. I'm just calling it that. Um, he said uh, some pretty interesting things in there, which I'm going to go over, mainly this this item called Globalism Trilemma. And that's pretty interesting on its own. So we'll go ahead and, and take a look at that. And um, some other things, including last week's interview with uh, Peter Kraut, and then uh, just see what Gerald has to say in his weekly message. I do have a few items from his his um, Trends Journal, but for time's sake, I think we'll just go over his weekly message and then we'll scoot on over or along with the program. So again, hope everyone's doing fine. Pablo Pena, Jay Delaney, how you doing? Seymour Rivers, good to see you again. Soundcheck, good. Appreciate that. Always do appreciate that. Uh, T. Copeland. So again, thank you all for being here. If you are new, go ahead and type in new. And if you do have questions for Vincent and I, uh, go ahead and type in a big letter Q and go ahead and put your question and hopefully we'll see it and then we'll try and get that answered for you. So I'll be with you guys shortly. Again, thanks for being here. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, your Left Eye Cataract Free host. I appreciate the well wishes that you all sent. That was very kind of you. And again, happy Mother's Day out there to all you mothers. Probably the hardest job in the world, which I don't know. So, um, God, appreciate you for what you do. So again, welcome aboard. Appreciate you all being here. Again, type in if you're new, go ahead and type in new. And if you have questions for Vincent and I, go ahead and type in Q and what your question may be. As always, you can find us on social media. We are at silverbullion.com.sg. That is our website. We do more than sell precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and as well as storing precious metals in the favorable jurisdiction of Singapore. But we also specialize in wealth protection. So if you do know what's going on and you have concerns, about wealth protection, or more importantly, systemic um, wealth protection, go ahead and shoot us an email at sales at silverbullion.com.sg, and we'll see what we can we can do with you and, and see what we what options we have. It's all about options nowadays. Silver Bullion SG is where you can find us on Facebook, Silver Bullion PL. PL for Private Limited is our handle on Twitter. Silver Bullion SG is our Instagram handle. I understand Instagram's been shaping up nowadays so hope you have a chance to go over and take a look at it audio only versions bit.ly slash sbtv itunes or slash sbtv spotify and crisis tracker if you have that telegram app or even if you don't go ahead and download it it is free and this is where vincent and i will go through economic news financial news gold and silver news and we'll try and find you know maybe the things that that have quite a bit of relevance to to you and i so we'll go ahead and sift through the weeds. And I do hope you join that group. One word, search Crisis Tracker with that Telegram app. So again, thank you all for being here. Moving on, our upcoming guest. Actually, it's going to be kind of a replay from what we had on the last live stream. Uh, since I missed last week, we're going to repost the Director T Sri Lanka interview. And for those of you who haven't already saw it, I'd be curious to know what you think about what's going on there. It's been getting more and more airtime in the news. And if you haven't seen it, again, we're going to post it up later this week. And I guarantee you there were a few eye-opening things that were said. So upcoming guest is going to kind of be a replay, but we'll get things back in order. And ebook thank you giveaway, which is actually an Amazon gift card giveaway, $10 Amazon gift card. And what we're going to be doing is giving it away. We're going to ask a question coming up shortly in this live stream. And if you can go ahead and, and guess it, we're going to give you 
a $10 Amazon gift card. It's going to come from the Peter Kraut interview, which we recently aired. To get that card, kind of easy. Just be one of the first five people to answer correctly uh, the question that I'm going to post up shortly. Within a minute and 30 seconds, I believe you're going to have to, to give your answer. So you got a lot of time to do it. U.S. winners, you're going to be given a link to download that Amazon gift card. And we're going to give it out after the live stream. Okay, so we'll pass you the link. If you're not from the U.S., just contact Amazon customer service and they'll go ahead and, and arrange something with you. As always, they're pretty good about these types of things. And you're going to have to give us your email so we can contact you. And, and the email that we're going to give you from us on our end is going to be sbtv at silverbullion.com.sg. So Vincent will post that up later. Vincent, how you doing? And um, you know, Vincent he had a little bit of surgery too on 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 his on his foot, so he's he's kind of hobbling along. So I had my left eye issue, and Vincent had his leg issue. So you know, we're just kind of leaning on each other, just trying to make our way around around Singapore. So um, yeah, keep Vincent in your your thoughts as well. Get get well, buddy. So again. Amazon gift card up for grabs. The question coming from that Peter Kraut interview is, the money we have today doesn't preserve its blank, blank. It's going to be two words. It's going to have to be exact. Um, you might not have even had to have watched the interview to, to know this one. So um, take a shot. Just take a shot. You, you, you never know. You may get it. So go ahead and take a shot. The money we have today doesn't preserve its blank, giddy, blank, blank, blank. Two blanks anyway. Go ahead and take a shot. So let's see. Um, let's see. John Ingle in the meantime, question seems clear. They are suppressing gold and silver with everything else up 30%. I worry they will flood the market with gold and silver at the same time. They introduce a digital currency. You know, we kind of don't know <laughs> what they're going to do, which is why I went ahead and took a look at that that uh, Klaus Schwab book. Um I would say main thing, just go ahead and keep keep getting it, keep stacking. But anyway, let's um let's get through this question first here. The money we have today doesn't preserve. It's blank, blank. So let me take a look at uh, some of the answers here coming in. Um, let's see. Elik, Irias, purchasing power. Michael Cole, purchasing power. Pablo Pina, purchasing power. T. Copeland, purchasing power. Seamus McGrath, monetary value. Uh, Bartos is the Carlos. <laughs> okay, let's see. And Pabar, purchasing power. And in fact, that's it. The answer is purchasing power. Purchasing power. Great job. And we actually did have five guys that, that came out and, and got it correctly. And they are Elit. Hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Purchasing power. And it is also Michael Cole. Got it correct. Purchasing power, and we had Pablo Pino, purchasing power, and we had T. Copeland, purchasing power, and one more sneaking it in under the gun is Pabar, purchasing power. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and, and put a link up, uh, uh, email link anyway, and then you can go ahead and, and contact us through that link. So again, the winners, real quick here, Elak Irias, you got it, Michael Cole, also got it. Pablo Pina also got it. T. Copeland got it. And also, last but not least, is Pabar. He also got it. So great job, guys. And just to make sure that this is the correct answer, what we're going to do is have a guest revisit and see if that is exactly what, what Peter Kral had said. You know, money is kind of made to seem complex and really it, it isn't. I talk about that also in the book. It boils down to the fact that if you think what money is, it's really a store of labor. People work, they earn money, they put it aside, and then it's to be used in the future. But the problem is that the kind of money we have today that's not backed by something of value obviously loses value. If you look at uh, what has happened to the U.S. dollar since it came into use in 1913 to today, it's down by, I think it's something like 97%. And so <laughs> that says it all, right? It does not preserve value. And so that's the risk is that the money we have today doesn't preserve its purchasing power People will count on it or are used to counting on socking away their money if they save for the future during you know other more difficult times or during retirement. And the danger is that it will not have the purchasing power that they expect it to have or they feel it should have. 
So there you go, purchasing power. Congratulations to each of you. Money is a store of your labor. Absolutely, absolutely. This is true. What are you worth? What are you worth, gang? You you got to put a tag on, on what you're worth, right? So what are you worth? The time, the time that you give cannot be given back. Money needs to compensate your time. You are exchanging your time. You're exchanging your time for money. That's what it is. You need money. Someone else needs your time. It's got to be fair. It's got to be fair. And that's where it's rough because what you're, what you're given value in is, is the dollar, which is losing its purchasing power. And, but you still gave up that time. And you know, so you can't get that time back, but just the value of your time that you gave is, is losing, it's losing the value of what it can buy. So got to, got to understand that time and, and money, they, they go together and labor, of course. All right. Another clip from Peter Crow. I don't want people to feel like they should stay away from something like silver or gold because they say, oh, you know, it's a manipulated market. As I say, the, the effects, I believe, are somewhat limited. And the longer term value it ultimately plays out, uh, exerts itself. And so it's absolutely a sector that people want to have exposure to no matter what. But uh, as I say, long term, do, do not let that shy you away from uh, participating in this market. Uh, there are ways to do it by lowering your risk. That's something I also talk about in the book. Different things you can do to mitigate your risk in a silver and silver investment portfolio. These work well. Silver is volatile. Take advantage of that volatility. Make it work for you. This can and will be a very profitable bull market. And that's exactly why I call the book The Great Silver Bull. I really think that anyone who is able to participate in this this market will very likely experience this as the best silver bull market they will ever experience. All right, Peter Carlton and his book. Actually, it is a pretty good book. Um, I couldn't really read it, but uh, one trick I've learned over time is just listen to it through Audible or something like that. And if you can, speed up the time to a minute. I mean, uh, not a minute, but 1.5 times the speed. And you'll get through these books a lot quicker and get the information you need. So a little bit of a of a cheat here on, on what we have to do sometimes. Anyway, Peter Kraut, silver and gold, are they in a manipulated market? Is it simply supply and demand? Uh, that's a tough one. Is it simply supply and demand, right? Is it a paper trading price where the cost of time and labor, which we just, which we just talked about, no longer applies? If it's a paper market, time and labor, I don't see how that applies anymore. If so, why are we buying gold and silver? Why are you buying gold and silver? Is it an investment? Is it an insurance? Uh, there's got to be a reason why you're buying it, right? So curious to know. Go ahead and put that in the comments. Why are you buying gold and silver? I'll say for me, I've never bought a single ounce as an investment. I've always bought it as an insurance. So curious to see what, what each of you has to say as well. One more clip from Peter Kraut. So actually, in my last chapter in the book, I talk about peak silver indicators. And one of them is FOMO, which is a fear of missing out. And so people will flock to something like silver, as they did in uh, 1979, 1980. That's an indicator that you're, you're near the end when you see that kind of behavior. Uh, you know, people basically throwing themselves at that particular asset. Another one is the gold-silver ratio. This is a very kind of classic one for this industry. If you look at what happened in 1980, when the ratio bottomed, it bottomed right around 15, meaning it took 15 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. That meant very expensive silver relative to gold. And so when silver is that expensive relative to gold, you should be looking for a potential time to exit. All right, time to exit. When is your time to exit silver? When is your time to exit gold? That's something we, we don't really think about too much, but you always got to kind of have an exit strategy, right? So curious to know, what is your exit plan? So who here has silver FOMO, fear of missing out? Who has a fear of missing out on silver right now? Who has a fear of missing out on gold? And if you guys have FOMO, because I kind of don't see too much FOMO going on in precious metals, mainly because it's, it's never in the news. It's never being pushed. Never been pushed, excuse me. And this is why perhaps no one no one really flocks to it. You know, you hear other things starting to run away on the upside and you want to jump in and get some before it gets too high. But you never really hear that with silver and gold. You never really get the FOMO with silver and gold. I mean, you know, maybe some of us do. I do at times as well. But 
generally speaking with the public, you, you never sense that FOMO. And um, it's, uh, it's concerning because there are so much more things going on. Reasons why you should be buying it, but you just aren't hearing it. So that, that's a huge concern. Uh, but again, this is why perhaps no one flocks to it. You don't get that FOMO. No one feels the need to go out and get it. I mean, what say you? What do you say about that? And when will you exit your precious metals position, if ever? When will when will you exit it? So I just want to take a quick look at, at what you're seeing here. Um, some of you guys will never exit uh, savings. You're buying silver for savings. You're buying it to preserve value. Uh, Mr. Nguyen is buying it for weightlifting. Okay, <laughs> expensive gym there. And uh, let me see what else is out there. Some investment. Okay, so we all have different reasons why we, we go ahead and, and buy things like silver and gold. But nonetheless, they are things that we need to understand and really start accumulating if we haven't already done so. Okay, um, well, Mr. Razor, at 84 to 1, should we trade gold for silver? I tell you what, that, that's a good question. Uh, let me put that up here. Sorry about that. 84 to 1, if you see that ratio, I know we saw it at about what, 125, somewhere around there, 125 to 1 before, 120 ish to, to 1. Uh, I know at that time, not many guys were buying gold. Everybody was piling into silver. But what about 84 to 1? Is that a time to buy silver? Is that a time to buy gold? I would say for me personally, definitely silver. And I'll, I'll show you why in, in just a bit. All right, moving on. Gerald Salente's Trends Journal. I tell you what, I'm just going to go over Gerald's weekly message here. Pretty interesting cover that he had. Uh, I'm in charge, the Ministry of Truth, Misinformation. I understand yeah, countries all over the world, it's not just the U.S. Countries all over the world are having these ministries of truth going on. And they are having laws and consequences if you really go outside the narrative of, of, what, of what you're supposed to know, I guess, according to them. Nonetheless, Gerald's weekly message, the mass media has become nothing more than mass propaganda outlets. God forbid you should question anything the government tells you, as this week's cover of the Trends Journal illustrates. Washington is creating a ministry of truth, ministry of truth to police the people with the formation of the disinformation. It is headed or headlined by Nina Jankovic, who has been shown on social media doing acts and stunts at the highest level of a third grade clown. I think I may have to agree with that. We report on the governance board and its leader in the technocracy section of this week's Trends Journal. On the Ukraine front, House Speaker Pelosi and other political hacks went to keep this week in a meet with Ukrainian President Zelensky to discuss, you guessed it, weapons, weapons, weapons. And there has been no talk of peace or concession since the start of 24 February Russian invasion. Polit politicians in the U.S. have made their motive clear. They want to degrade country R's military so it becomes impotent on the world stage emphasizing that the business of America is war. And at that time, President Joe Biden went to Lockheed Martin, the nation's biggest war industry contractor, where he boasted to its workers that the U.S. would keep, would keep sending more lethal weapons to Ukraine to defeat country R. And the crowd cheered. On the economic front, the U.S. Federal Reserve raised rates by half a percentage point in their battle to combat skyrocketing inflation that hit a 40-year high. Will it work? Will it work? So I'll end uh, that that portion of General Salente's Trends Journal because I'm going to show, uh, bring up one article a bit later on uh, in this in this live stream. So we'll, we'll hang on tight for that. So that was a, a look at our guest revisit portion. Let's move on to our website, silverbullion.com.sg. Take a quick look at Gold and silver here. Let me refresh this. And what do we have? We have gold or silver, 2234. So it's still on that that little bit of a downtick. Gold, sub 1900 at 1881. So both metals, a little bit on the downside this morning here in Asia. So we got a lot to uh, we got a lot to 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 do to try and get these metals back up. If you want them to go up, if not, then uh. As they say, back up the truck, back up the truck, and, and go ahead and get yourself some. Silver to gold ratio, 84.2. Amazing. Somebody just asked that question about if the ratio were at 84. Well, 
your answer is silver is currently inexpensive to gold at 84 to 2. And this is when you would switch to silver anytime you're at about that 80 level, according to the ratio. Reason being, again, because silver is so undervalued compared to gold at this point, this is where you might want to consider playing the silver to gold ratio. And then as the ratio goes back down, you exchange the silver for gold. As the ratio goes up, you exchange your gold for silver or perhaps jump into the market at that point getting silver. So it's good to, to watch this ratio. It is, I'm going to say it is a cheaper way to go ahead and, and get yourself some gold. If that's what you really want to do, it just takes a bit of time. Featured products that we do have, of course, the gold maples, uh, silver eagles, uh, kangaroos. And then we have the kilobars, gold kilobars, 1,000 ounce LBMA bars. So pretty, um, pretty well diverse here at our shop. Uh, Reserve Mega Vault Alternative Asset Center is still being built or renovated, I should say. A uh, lot of work going on. I tell you, this is going to be an, an amazing, amazing thing once it's done. Um, so stick around. We're going to post updates from time to time on, on what's happening with it. And then um, this is a pretty interesting article here that came out in our, our newsletter. How a country circumvented U.S.-led embargo to buy gold clandestinely so these are some things so let me take a look at the um again i always take like to take a look at this 1000 ounce silver lbma bar we do have one in the shop make sure you bring your trolley down and pick it up it is heavy we do have 384 bars in the vault and these are bars that you buy and you own okay you own it it is not a leasing program or anything like that to own it simply sign up as a silver bullion user Choose from one of the six accounts. Maybe you want a type of a precious metals IRA account. That would be on the retirement account. Maybe you want a trust account. Maybe you need a, a type of a business account or maybe something for the kids. Join account with, with the minor. Easiest one, though, is a personal account. All you need is basic information, just your, a lot of times your passport as identification and just simply fill out the application. Uh, basic info here. And then you can go ahead and let them know that you found Silver Bullion through SBTV. And again, it's because it's really all about options. Uh, you, we all are going to need options right now at, at this point. So uh, let's try and understand what we can have as far as option goes. And, and this one, always make sure that you do tick uh, customer notifications that are encrypted via secure notification. All it means really is when you have an email from us, we email it to you uh, all you're going to have in the body of an email is you have a notification from us. So this helps to keep everything um, still another layer of security for you to, to keep from the prying eyes of, of the alphabet companies and such. And again, if you have questions, a lot of times your answers can be found here in the resource section. Uh, things like over the silver ratio, payment options, things like that. And of course, our P2P loans. This is one reason why, a very good reason why you would want to store with us. You can actually use your gold and silver as collateral to go ahead and, and, and request to have a loan on it. Use it as collateral again. In this case, somebody wants a one month loan. He wants US dollars. He's asking if he can get two and a half percent interest, Adam. He wants to borrow 96,000. And so he's asking if anybody's willing to lend that. So he has his, his gold and silver as collateral. And these people here, basically, they just have an account and what they had is they fund that account and, and they use it to go ahead and, and let people borrow this money. So in this case, he wants to borrow 96000 We do have people who can who can go ahead and lend that money. Here's one here at 95 at 4.25. But this guy's asking two and a half. So, you know, he needs to maybe up his a little bit. And again, he is using his bullion as collateral. He's using... Uh, 5 kg parcel here, another 5 kg parcel here. So this is all what he's using. Okay, all of these these parcels here, and he's putting them up as collateral to go ahead and and get that loan. So you, so you can see he has quite a bit of the the smaller stuff, 1 kg and 10 ounce silver bars. Uh, so you know very good. What he's doing is he's he's making his um his investment slash insurance work, where he can go ahead and and redeploy his his assets once again. So that's pretty good. Again, it's another reason why you would like to go ahead and store with us. Heading over to Twitter, bookmarks. Let's see what's going on here. I don't know if you guys saw this. This was pretty cool, though. I mean, I'll, I'll just play it. I consider this guy Rich Strike. 
I just want to call him Silver. To me, in my mind, he's he's called Silver. High hole Silver. And battling with Messier. They're stride for stride. Epicenter and Zozo's in behind them. Cyberdex sweeps up on the outside. Sandon gets the rail run. And they're into the stretch. And it's Messier, Crown Pride. And Epicenter is coming up on the outside. Epicenter has taken the lead as they arrive into the final furlong. Sandon is coming after him. Epicenter and Sandon. These two there goes Silver. For stride. Simplification down the outside is next. They're coming down to the wire. Epicenter Sandon. Rich Strike is coming up on the inside. Oh my goodness. The longest shot has won the All right. So there, there he goes. Let me just mute this first. Rich strike. I, I call this guy silver. I tell you that that was like um I'm not a horse racing guy, but that's pretty pleasing to watch. This guy just really come all the way from the back and maneuver in there and then and, and take the win. Good job. I'm that's I'm calling that guy silver. Egon von Greyers, the first panacea of a mismanaged nation is inflation of the currency. The second is war. Both bring a temporary prosperity, both bring a permanent ruin, but both are the refuge of political and economic opportunists. Quote from Ernest Hemingway. Uh, David Morgan asking a question. Is this smart? Let me play it from the beginning here. Universal norms. Smart cities are no longer a thing of science fiction, but how we collect and use citizens' data responsibly and sustainably is the big next hurdle. To help tackle this, the Smart Cities Mission India joined the G20 Smart City Alliance shared by the World Economic Forum to establish universal norms and guidelines for safe and responsible implementation of smart city technology. Hmm. Smart cities are no longer a All thing. right, so that's debatable. We'll leave that up in the air. Uh, just Rob Panner, I just want to take a look at this comment here. Uh, that Rich Strike horse that won the Kentucky Derby <laughs> went mental after the race and started biting all the other horses. You know what? I don't blame that horse because if Silver ever does that, I'm, I'm going to I might just take a chomp on a few people or two my, myself. So, again, go Silver. That was pretty, pretty inspirational there. The Ned Zhang, can a government that's got to fund its spending really up issuing bonds? It's a good question. Or will the central bank just go into this vicious doom loop? Nice word. Doom loop with the government and the banks that are forced to buy the government garbage. I mean, government debt. Great point there. What do you folks think about that? Just making a great point. Listen up to that one for sure. Colin Cartel, gold is doing its job, holding strong. I would not want to be anywhere else right now. And that is true. I think a lot of us feel, feel the same here. I'm not sure, TF Metals Report, I'm not sure that publicly acknowledging this is a very good idea. There were reports of, uh, seem, I guess, some nefarious things going on again. Uh, let's see what else is out there. Keith Wiener, dollar index over 103.5. All other currencies down as the USD fan base of the dollar will collapse against all other currencies. Not so much. So yes, yes, we know, except, except, excuse me, the once in future gold, oil, ruble. So Keith making another good point there where you know, he, he doesn't believe that, you know, the dollar is, is going to collapse, you know, uh, and, and really uh, implode as a lot of people see it. So, you know, he's, he's got a strong opinion on this, but it makes sense as, as well. Uh, Gold and Silver UK saying that some interesting info coming through about the situation in Sri Lanka from a direct contact of mine. Seems like ongoing 12 to 13 hour power cuts, no gas for cooking, no fuel, government freezing accounts, withdrawals, basically saying the economy is collapsing. So I guess to get more on that, uh, be sure to watch that Director T interview coming up later on this week. And I'll finish out with Rick Rule here. We're at a place where the interest on the U.S. 10-year is less than the CPI stated rate of inflation, which means if you give them money for 10 years, they absolutely positively will give you back less. His friend Jim Grant calls this return free risk. All right, so that'll wrap up the, the Twitter component of this, this, this live stream. And we'll move on to our topic of the day. Topic of the day. Hang in there with this one. Hang in there with this. I'm going to have to read some things for you because it did come from his book. 
the book, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab. I want to take a look at it, just one part of it. It, it is pretty fascinating. Uh, my intention is not to make this a political good guy, bad guy type of a thing, but I know all of you guys have your opinions on this already. However, we are at a time. We are at a time where mankind's destiny and history will either be written by you or written by someone else. Um, if you want to keep that pen in your hand, um, that pen's going to have to be mightier than the sword, as, as they would say. If you want to keep that pen in your hand, hold it tight. Part of the history that will be changed is our geopolitical makeup. And that means our money. Directly or indirectly, these will both change. And it'll change according to what you and what I allow it to. There's no greater investment than you. You know, we always talk about investing in this, that, this, that. Don't forget you. You're the most important investment out there. Don't ever forget that. Maybe it's something we should talk about more. You're the greatest investment out there. Don't ever forget it. Therefore, we are going to have to, and we do need to see what the powers that be are up to and why. Now, it's no secret ground zero with much of the changes that are coming. They are coming from the World Economic Forum and the vision of people like Klaus Schwab. So let's start by taking a look at, at just who is Klaus Schwab. So let me get back here uh, to the Internet. This is a little bit about his life, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of skip forward through some of these things and, and I'll just get here down to the WEF portions of it. So in 71, Schwab founded the European Management Forum, which was renamed the WEF or the World Economic Forum back in 1987. In 71 or yeah, 1987, excuse me, in 71, he also published uh, Modern Enterprise Management in Mechanical Engineering. And in that book, he argued that the management of a modern enterprise must serve both shareholders and corporate stakeholders to achieve long-term growth and prosperity. And Schwab has championed the multi-stakeholder concept in the World Economic Forum's inception. So in 2003, Schwab appointed Jose Maria Figueres as the CEO of the WEF with the intent that Figueres would be his successor. However, October 2004, Figueres resigned over his undeclared receipts of more than 900000 in consultancy fees from the French telecommunications firm Alcatel. Anyway, let, let's move forward a little bit. Some of the criticism, though, with the WEF is while Schwab declared that excessively high management salaries, such as 900000 or a million, I guess, no longer socially acceptable. They are no longer socially acceptable with his own salary of about 1 million Swiss francs, has been repeatedly questioned by the media. The Swiss radio and television corporation SRF mentioned this salary level in the context of ongoing public contributions to the WEF and the fact that the forum does not pay any federal taxes. And moreover, the former Frankfurter uh, Zeitung, I, yes, excuse me, sir, journalist Jürgen Dunsch made the criticism that the WEF's financial reports were not very transparent since neither income nor expenditure were broken down. And Schwab has also drawn ire for mixing the finances of the not-for-profit WEF and other for-profit business ventures. For example, WEF awarded a multi-million dollar contract to the U.S. web in 1998. But some of the, the bigger reasons why, I guess, us non-elites, <laughs> why we have concerns with the WEF, are things like, according to the Transnational Institute, the forum, hence, is planning to replace a recognized democratic model with a model where a self-selected group of stakeholders make decisions on behalf of you and me. The think tank summarizes that we are increasingly entering a world where gatherings such as Davos are a, check this out, silent, a silent global coup d'etat to capture governance. So what say you about that? That's pretty significant there, That just that quote right there. So there you go. The issue the non-elites, non-elites have, like you and me, well, I don't, maybe you're, you're an elite guy, not me, though. I'm, I'm a non-elite guy. <laughs> so to repeat, according to this Transnational Institute, the forum is, hence, planning to replace recognized, recognized democratic models with a model where a self-selected group of stakeholders make decisions on behalf of the people. 
A think tank summarizes that we are increasingly entering a world where gatherings such as Davos are a silent global coup d'etat to capture governance. So again, what say you? Do you think this way? Is this what you're seeing as well? Let me take a quick look at the comments before we start to dive into Mr. Schwab's book. Uh, let's see. <laughs> You guys really love him, don't you? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at his comments here. I don't know if I can, if I can repeat this stuff. Uh, but um, yeah, Let, let's see. I can't really put anything up that you guys commented. So, all right, let her rip. Just go ahead and, and share your opinions. Nothing, nothing, nothing wrong there. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. So let's take a, a look into Mr. Schwab's book. Keep your comments going. Um, if I don't repeat them, it doesn't mean I don't like them. It just means maybe, maybe I can't post them, but at least each of you can go ahead and see what they are. So his book, I call it The Global Pandemic, The Great Reset. You guys know why I call it. Oh, I said that word. The Global Bug. Excuse me. The Global Bug, The Great Reset. The connectivity between geopolitics and pandemics flows both ways. On the one hand, the chaotic end of multilateralism a vacuum of global governance and the rise of various forms of nationalism make it more difficult to deal with the outbreak. The bug is spreading globally and sparing no one, while simultaneously the geopolitical fault lines that divide societies spur many leaders to focus on national responses, a situation that constrains collective effectiveness and reduces the ability to eradicate the global bug. And more recently, Kevin Rudd, president of the Asia Society Policy Institute and former Australian prime minister expressed similar sentiments, worrying specifically about the coming post-global bug anarchy. Look at the word he used, anarchy. The various forms of rampant nationalism, rampant nationalism, are taking the place of order and cooperation. The chaotic nature of national and global responses to the global bug thus stands as a warning of what could come on an even broader scale. Interesting words there, right? So according to the book, it's pretty plain here. Nationalism makes it more difficult to deal with the outbreak. That's a bit of give and take. I mean, you can understand why, and you can also understand why not. So that's a bit of give and take there. Nationalism constrains collective effectiveness, reduces the ability to eradicate the global bug. So these are two pretty obvious points here. Thing is, to the first point, it's debatable. It is debatable, and, and I'll let you decide with one comment, one comment being the common denominator of every sovereign country is balancing what is best for my people under the laws and powers that my people gave me. So that's the one common denominator there. And regarding collective effectiveness, who is the leader of the collective? You know, that's that's a huge question here. Who's the leader of the collective? One person can't rule the whole the whole world right so is it one person just trying to go ahead and influence leaders of the world who then have lead uh, then have uh, some rule over you and i so who's the collective and did the collective eradicate the bug that's for you to decide as well or perhaps do the leaders of the collective eradicate do they eradicate the thought of and chip away at national sovereignty. And, and I'm going to explain why in just a bit with this uh, this definition or this item called the global trilemma. So um, hang in there. Okay, we're going to get there. Let's be straight, though. What we are seeing is that there is no place for nationalism and globalism or in globalism, I should say. And this is pretty important because this comes back to our money, our currency, and they are tied into national sovereign economies, correct? I mean, your money is tied into your economy. Perhaps even cultures, perhaps even values. And this is part of what makes each country unique. It's part of what makes a country diverse. And these are the things that, in, in my opinion, they make a country beautiful. They make the people there beautiful. You have that diversity, that color, that vibrancy. Uh, you don't all want it to be just one conformed way and then take all the color and and an atmosphere out of it, right? Okay, moving on. In this messy new world defined by a shift towards multipolarity and intense competition for influence, the conflicts or tensions will no longer be driven by ideology, 
but spurred by nationalism and the competition for resources. If no one power can enforce order, our world will suffer from a global order deficit. Unless individual nations and international organizations succeed in finding solutions to better collaborate at the global level, we risk entering an age of entropy in which retrenchment, fragmentation, anger, and parochialism will increasingly define our global landscape, making it less intelligible and more disorderly. Again, this is it's kind of the way they think there, right? Key takeaways. Competition for influence. Are we seeing that? We are definitely seeing that, right? There we call it an info war. There's competition for influence and information. Make no mistake. Nationalism. Nationalism. Nationalism kind of doesn't have a place in globalism. That's also what they're saying here. And competition for resources. We're definitely seeing this right now. We are definitely seeing this. So if no one power can enforce, enforce order, excuse me, our world will suffer from a global order deficit. So again, if no one power can enforce order, our world will suffer from a global order deficit. So we are seeing these three things today. Um, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this is one reason, one big reason why gold, silver commodities are important. These are what is real. These are what are real money. These are the things of real value. Ultimately, the worth or value of a country, in my opinion here, it's just my opinion, will be on perhaps the gold it has in reserves, the resources it has that it can offer up the world, and the ability to turn those resources into things we can use, things like refining, things like that. I think these things are, are going to come heavily uh, or way heavily into what a country will be valued as or, or what a country, or, hate to say it, but down to its people will, will be worth. So something we've got to keep in mind. And, and then it said the world will suffer from a global order deficit without a power to enforce order. Interesting words there. What is the global order deficit? I'm still trying to figure that one out. And what power is going to enforce it? Uh, you can't have one power unless there's a lot of powers that, that kind of uh, submitted or gave things up or agreed to to one power to, to enforce or one collective mind. An elected power? Will it be an elected power? Hard to say. I mean, when you look at uh, organizations like the WF, the BIS, uh, WHO, when you look at these organizations who seem to have the, some kind of power or influence over collective nations, they're not elected. So how could they ever be accountable to, to you and me? All right, let's move on. The implosion of some failing states or petrol states. Interesting. <laughs> interesting here. I guess he's pointing the finger at someone. The implosion of some failing states or petrol states, the possible unraveling of the EU, a breakdown between China and the U.S. that leads to war, all these and many more have now become possible, albeit hopefully unlikely scenarios. Four main issues that will become more prevalent in the post-global bug era and that conflate with each other, the erosion of globalization, the absence of global governance, the increasing rivalry between the U.S. and China, and the fate of fragile or failing states. And we're seeing failing states all over the place right now. The global economy is so intricately intertwined that it is impossible to bring globalization to an end. However, it is possible to slow it down and even to put it into reverse. It's already re-erected borders with a vengeance, reinforcing to an extreme trends that were already in full glare before it erupted with the full force in March of 2020 such as tougher border controls and greater protectionism is what he's calling it. Greater protectionism mainly because of fears about globalization. I'd, I'd have to disagree with him on this completely. Nonetheless, it's his book. He goes on to say tighter border controls for the purpose of managing the progression of the global bug make eminent sense, but the risk that the revival of the nation state leads, he's calling it a risk, the risk of the revival of the nation state leads progressively to much greater nationalism is real. A reality that the globalization trilemma framework offered by Donnie Roderick captured. Okay, so we're going to touch on this, the global 
globalization trilemma, excuse me. Going in, globalization going in reverse is a clear worry here. Oh, regionalization, okay, it, it may seem like a compromise where globalization has to back up a bit. It's going to go into regionalization. However, he, being Schwab and the WF, they fear nations being protectionist. They fear nations being protectionist. Why? Well, if we are real, the world's reserve currency, the transfer of payments, SWIFT system, raw materials, manufacturing, goods, tech, energy, information, they are all weaponized right now. Make no mistake. All of them are weaponized right now, information especially. So to that point, to that degree, he does kind of have a point there. Schwab does have a point. And this is where the globalization trilemma comes in, where either democracy, sovereignty, or globalization, one of those has to be given up. So we'll take a look at it. In the early 2010s, when globalization was becoming a sensitive political and social issue, the Harvard economist explained why it would be the inevitable casualty if nationalism rises. The trilemma suggests that the three notions of economic globalization, political democracy, and the nation state are mutually irreconcilable based on the logic that only two, only two can effectively coexist at any given time. Democracy and national sovereignty are only compatible if globalization is contained. By contrast, if both the nation state and globalization flourish, then democracy becomes untenable. And then if both democracy and globalization expand, there is no place for the nation state. And therefore, one can only ever choose two out of the three. And this is the essence, this is the essence of the trilemma. Pretty rough there, right? Okay. Democracy and national sovereignty. In order for those two to come out ahead, no globalization. You, globalization cannot thrive, survive, if you have democracy and national sovereignties. Or sovereignty and globalization. If you want those two, then you have to give up democracy. Democracy cannot, cannot coincide with sovereignty and globalization. You've kind of seen this, right? Or if you want democracy and globalization, then you can't really have a national sovereignty. So pick your poison, really, pick your poison. We know globalization or watered-down regionalization will stay. That is going to stay. But that painfully obvious at this point. Globalization or regionalization is going to stay. So what goes? Sovereignty or democracy? And this takes us back to money takes us back to money. The euro may work because it's it, it, it's not a currency belonging to one particular sovereign country. The U.S. dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Mexican peso in regionalization will become, dare I say, the Amero. You guys remember that word from a while back, the Amero? Not saying it's going to be the Amero. It may be called the Fed coin or something else. But again, the euro, perhaps the Amero, Fed coin, whatever it's going to be, who knows what it's going to be called or what it's going to be in Asia, what it's going to be in Africa. Whatever it is, currency that belongs to any one sovereign country will be replaced for a regional currency. At least that's the way it looks to me when, when reading Schwab's book here. It's about money, resources, and being able to refine resources into things we need and can use. It's about supply chains. It unfolds into supply chains. The most visible form of progressive deglobalization will occur at the heart of its nuclear reactor, the global supply chain that has become emblematic of globalization. How and why will this play out? The shortening or relocation of supply chains will be encouraged by businesses that see it as a risk mitigation measure against supply chain disruption, a resilience versus efficiency trade-off, and two, Political pressure from both the right and left. Let's just say political pressure because people are going to really, you know, get a hold of what's going on and they are going to start to stand up. Hopefully, hopefully. But since 2008, the drive towards greater localization has been firmly on the political agenda in many countries, particularly in the West. But it will now be accelerated in the post-global bug era. 
And this process of reversing de or reversing globalization will not happen overnight. Shortening supply chains will be both very challenging and very costly. For example, a thorough and all-encompassing decoupling from China would require from companies making such a move an investment of hundreds of billions of dollars in newly located factories and from governments equivalent amounts to fund new infrastructures like airports, transportation links, and housing to serve the relocated supply chain. Now, notwithstanding that the political desire for decoupling may in some cases be stronger than the actual ability to do so, the direction of the trend is nonetheless clear. So what say you? What say you? Can we regionalize? It's going to take time. Is there time to do it? Do you think the average person will want to regionalize, perhaps losing individualism to more competition, perhaps unfair? competition where regulations place speed bumps and walls to entrepreneurs and make it easier for bigger, deeper pockets to get an advantage. So what are the pluses to regionalization over globalism? Let me take a look at a few comments here. Take a breath as well. Uh, let's see. Um, Carrie Ellen Wilder, nationalism, populism is a good thing as long as it is properly focused within the constraints of limited government and constitutional republicanism. That's a good point. That That is a good point there. Okay. Um, let's see what else is out there. Um, and, and Rod, you know, this is the thing here. The euro does not work because one size does not fit all. I mean, you have countries such as Germany, uh, Italy, and, and we all know the differences, right? I mean, Germany seems to be doing well economically and, and Italy not doing so well. You had the, the pigs nations who also weren't doing well. But again, within Europe, the Eurozone, you have countries that are doing well. So how do you have one currency and, and place a value on that currency where some economies aren't doing too good and other economies are doing very well? How do you how do you really place a value on it? So that, that was always one issue that the euro had. Let me take a look at more comments here. Um, uh, Bill Wood, it's a great point here. Don't discount the possible balkanization of the U.S. The left and right cannot reconcile their differences. I don't think they want to. Um, it's gotten to a point this is more about, you know, who wins the game rather than the people who are, people being you and me, the people who are involved in it. They just kind of want to claim victory each side. And it doesn't matter what the cost is to the people. So it's 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 a sad point, sad place that we've, we've gotten to that. Uh, let's see. And Richard Wizardry, I like that name. We don't have money today. We have currency, and that doesn't keep value. Uh, it's true. Currency is just not keeping the value, and that goes back, of course, to your time, to your labor. You can't get that that time back. So that's a great point there. Okay, so so let's let's move on here. The most likely outcome along the globalization, no globalization continuum, lies in an in-between solution, regionalization. Even the three states that compose North America now trade more with each other than with China or Europe. As Parakana points out, regionalism was clearly overtaking globalism before the global bug exposed the vulnerabilities of our long-distance interdependence. North America, Europe, and Asia focused increasingly on regional self-sufficiency rather than on the distant and intricate global supply chains that formerly epitomized the essence of globalization. What form might this take? It could resemble the sequence of events that brought an earlier period of globalization to an end, but with a regional twist. Improved global governance, the most natural and effective mitigating factor against protectionist tendencies. However, we do not yet know how its framework will evolve in the foreseeable future. At the moment, the signs are ominous that it is not going in the right direction. There is no time to waste if we do not improve the functioning and legitimacy of our global institutions. The world will soon become unmanage unmanageable and very dangerous. There cannot be a lasting recovery without a global strategic framework or governance. Why does it feel like, you know, there's, you know, this side and that side and, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, they see us as like uh, such a hassle to them. You know, we, we want independence, sovereignty, freedom, things like that. But for them, you just can't have it. They have their own ideas. Well, I mean, why does it seem this way where, you know, 
two totally different types of, of views. Nonetheless, unmanageable and dangerous for who? That's my question. Unmanageable and dangerous for who? Schwab is telling you things you might not like, but he's telling you nonetheless where things are going, especially with our youth. Youth activism is increasing worldwide, being revolutionized by social media, and that increases mobilization to an extent that would have been impossible before. It takes many different forms, ranging from non-institutionalized political participation to demonstrations and protests, and addresses issues as diverse as climate change, economic reforms, gender equality, and LGBTQ rights. The young generation is firmly at the vanguard of social change, and there is little doubt that it'll be the catalyst for change and a source of critical momentum for the Great Reset. It's all coming down to the youth, um, mobilization, social media, things like this. It's coming down to things like information. What information do people get? What information do people not get? It's coming down to resources. Who has them? It's coming down to places that can refine. Who can refine the oil? Who can refine these, these raw materials and the things we can use? It's coming down to things like energy, all of these things. So you really got to I think you really got to, or we all really have to ask ourselves, you know, which direction is the world going? Because it does seem like pieces on this chessboard, they are absolutely moving. I want to take you to one more, um, one more piece here. Uh, hang on. Let me, let me get there for you. It should be, hang on guys. There's one more article from, um, this is from, Again, Gerald Salente's Trends Journal. Uh, let me pull this up. Sorry about that. Okay, here it is. Sorry. Uh, this is about the um, what we've kind of been talking about here. Excuse me, it should be on page 54, 52, 53. 52, okay. For China's lockdowns, cancel post-COVID supply chain improvements. Again, goes back to the supply chain, which they mentioned as well. China's extremist anti-COVID policies have locked millions of residents into their homes or workplaces for weeks, shutting down ports and subjecting an estimated 22 trillion worth of goods to months of disruption in manufacture and distribution, according to Bloomberg. As of 27 April, 230 container ships were stuck in Shanghai's ports, far more nearby, 35% more than a year earlier. Let me just get to, to the main parts here. Um, Okay, so what, what, what they're saying here is uh, once product export activities resume and a large volume of vessels make their way to the U.S. West Coast ports, we expect waiting times to increase significantly, according to Julie, uh, Julie Gerdman. And this has accelerated, accelerated the pressing need for supply chains to become more regional, according to Lorenzo Berho. CEO of Mexican building firm Vesta. He said in a press uh, briefing last month, globalization as we know it may be coming to its end. Okay, globalization as we know it may be coming to its end, and that means it's going to revert to regionalization. Okay? It's going to revert to regionalization. That's what it seems like, and that's going to wrap up the, the topic of the day. We'll head over to commentary, but first, I want to see what what you folks are 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 saying about this or what you have to say. Um, it, it is it's changing, you know. It, everybody thought it was globalized, globalized, globalization. Sorry, and I will say back in uh, university when we came across Milton Friedman and and he talked about globalism and how it was such a wonderful thing. Um, I had a problem with it. The problem I had with globalization when I first heard of it back in university by the likes of people like Milton Friedman was that you always needed a low-cost producer. You always will need a low-cost producer when it comes to globalization. And that kind of bothered me a bit because in order for that to happen, as one country rises, another country has to be down below in, in, in order for them to be so-called pulled out of poverty. But eventually it gets to a point. It gets to a point where it's expensive everywhere. And, and I, I liken this to when I, I first started the electrical trade as an apprentice, I got paid $7.11 an hour. And every year we got about a dollar raise. 
And our journeymen at that time, they were getting about $25 an hour. And they were also getting about a dollar raise every year. And even back then, I, I asked myself, I said, hey, we're getting expensive. It's going to be expensive for, for our companies to employ us, which means all of these projects, they're going to become more expensive. They're all going to get bid up. And this was a union company. And again, what you find is that your politicians, you know, they need those union votes. So what they're going to do is, you know, obviously these jobs are going to end up in the hands of union workers, but they're going to cost more. And that means even though I'm getting a pay raise every year, I'm having to pay more in taxes every year. So it's like, I, I don't really win. <laughs> I don't win anything, but the people lose. You know, I mean, every time something gets more and more and more expensive uh, because politicians, they, I don't know, they, they pander for votes. And then in the end, things need to get built. They cost more, taxpayers pay for it. Um, so again, all a part of kicking the can down the road and we're running out of road, really. Truthfully, we're running out of road. Let me take a look here. Um, Paul Barr, fair statement. Regionalization seems like a more durable system. Fair statement. I mean, I, I'd have to agree with that. If I had to choose between the two, I, I'd have to agree with that. But then it comes down to, are you willing to give up either sovereignty or democracy for regionalization to happen? So again, it's a real conundrum. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, troubling issue that, that we got to kind of think about here. Uh, let's see what else is out here. Um, yeah, this is a good point. We will have one when regionalization devolves to localism. Idealistically, love it. Realistically, you know, I wish there were a way to do it, you know, but the, we've, we're accustomed to so many things now. Our, our, our living styles, are, you know, lifestyles are in, in a different arena from, from decades and decades and decades ago where you, you kind of do need to reach out and trade and have some form of a global regionalization, whatever it is. Um, but idealistically, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there for sure. Uh, let's see what else is out there. Uh, hooch. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was a sparky before or yeah, before my sumo days. <laughs> it's getting there. Um, okay. So let me, let me move on a bit. Does this all make sense now when we think of central banks and digital currencies and regionalization, regionalization, we're backtracking here. When the ECB, when the Federal Reserve talk of CBDCs, they're talking about money in a region. Okay, this isn't this one global currency for all the world. They're talking about money in a region. So think about it. They don't talk about a global currency except for perhaps the SDR. The only two other global currencies that I know may be precious metals and maybe crypto because it's kind of borderless here. So those are the other two currencies that I would see as being global, especially gold and silver without question. And this goes back to the globalization trilemma. If a watered down globalization stays in the form of regionalization and some sort of sovereignty remains with regionalization, then that means democracy has to go. And so let me ask you, are you willing to see democracy go? Are we seeing democracy being uprooted? So you kind of know the answer of what, of what they're looking to, to do again. And let me fast forward this here. So according to Schwab and the gang, nationalism and democracy seems to be an inconvenience, or it is an inconvenience. And that makes your personal sovereignty an inconvenience. Your freedom, your ability to think freely are all inconvenient. They are. Is it any wonder why countries across the globe are creating ministries of truth. We saw that on the cover of Gerald Salente's Trends Journal, and I can tell you we see it in other countries. They are forming ministries of truth, and there are actual criminal, let's say, penalties you're going to have to pay if you go against whatever these ministry of truths are saying. So keep that in mind, gang. And as I said before, this is the main thing. Truth is a liability. Anytime you want to say truth, it becomes a liability. The narrative truths, they're a lie ability. Sure seems that way to me anyway, which is why we got to kind of take what we can and figure things out on our own, re-engineer things, build it back up and understand what's going on. But as people like Lawrence Lepard say, if you want to fix the world, 
I guess Schwab does, and all these people want to fix the world in some way, their way, I suppose. But if you want to fix the world, you have to fix the money. You have to fix the money. And more than anything else, silver and gold, they fix this. They absolutely do fix this. So that'll kind of wrap up the live stream, the commentary. And, and again, I'll take a look at what, what you have to say here. Uh, yes, good comment here. The writing was on the wall when we let our supply chains extend past our peripheral vision. Uh, that, that's a good point. I mean, realistically, why? how did it get to, you know, you, the world basically gives one everything to one factory to make, let's say. And if the factory isn't happy with anything, you know, they, they can slow down, they can stop making it, they can stop shipping it to you, whatever it is. I mean, you, you put yourself in a pretty perilous situation, you know? I mean, if, if people don't want to play ball anymore, uh, you you put yourself in a very, very dangerous spot. So that, that's a great that's a great comment here. Uh, Mr. Nguyen, democracy is being redefined. It's a great point. That's a great point. It is being redefined. I won't argue with you there. Uh, let's see what else is out there. Um, <laughs> let's see what else is, is out here. Um, let's see. Yeah, Bill Wood. Um, I'd have to agree with this too. Truth is the first casualty of war. That's been said by many a scholar. Truth is the first casualty of war. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and it's a shame. You know, why, why can't we, well, why can't we know the truth? You know, I mean, isn't, isn't that a way, you know, for us to, to make things better? You know, you know, the reality of things, you build it up, you make it better. Uh, you're able to take care of more things that way. It, it's not about power. Um, I don't think truth has anything to do with power, but not telling the truth that has a lot to do with power or trying to get power or not give away power. So there's, there's a big difference there. Uh, let's see. Take a look at a few more. Uh, yeah, built for tough soil and green. I was thinking of that as well. I, I think I may go and uh, revisit that. Um, so again, what what do you guys think? I mean, because this does have to do with with our money. We know the dollar is dying. Interesting how it's 103 on the DXY compared to or relative to other currencies. Dollar is strong. Dollar is very strong, and we're all expecting or, or thinking there's going to be some kind of dollar collapse. I, I thought that as well. I kind of backed up on it. And, and the way I kind of looked at it is you don't necessarily need the dollar to collapse. You just don't have to use it. And that happens when you have different type of uh, transfer of payments or you start taking in something other than, than the dollar. So you don't necessarily need it to collapse. You just need other people, other countries to start using something else. And that will, that will really start to take it down and, and inflate it. So again, something to keep in mind as well. Um, let's see, T. Copeland, silver, copper, lead, privacy, cryptos. I'll get, I'll agree with you on three or four. I'll let you guess what the fourth one might, <laughs> might be that I have a little different view on, but again, it's about options, right? Everybody, they will take the options as they see fit for them. So what I might do might not be what you'll do. What you'll do might not be what, what I'll do, but it's good to have options. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, so I guess we're about caught up here. The guys who won the books will be sending those out after the live stream. Um, don't want to keep you guys too late. It's Mother's Day, right? So mamas, get back with your families. Dads, get back with your wives and moms. And I mean, spend time with your family, right? That's what it's all about. We're all in this together. Don't ever forget that. I'm, I'm with you guys. We're all in it together. We got to keep our head on a swivel, see what's going on, and be a blessing. Be a blessing, not a burden. So go spend time with mom. I'll see you guys uh, next week. I think next week is a holiday, so I have to find out what the what the time schedule will be. But again, moms, thank you for all you do. Saddle up for what's ahead and silver up. I'll see you guys next week. Take care.